I'm back with another Anycubic printer review. This is their resin printer. Now I'm not a big fan of resin printers, so let's see if this one will change my mind. And my friend Chris is here too. So once he gets done eating his lunch, maybe he will chime in. Because Chris, you you have a UV printer, don't you? Uh, yes, I do. I'm trying to make some modifications to my printer so that um, primarily the <clears throat> Z-axis, I'm trying to make it so that it uses integrated... Ah, yes. Yeah, came, is this for the fumes or because of you know what? I don't know. It's hard to say these days. <laughs> Screw thread, you know, that oh, yeah. rod's right built into them. Instead of having the... Um, the coupler? The coupler, yeah. yeah. So. Is there less backlash that way? Yeah, and also because this one, the because the Z-axis is kind of hanging off of it, I was worried about just the strain on the coupler. Oh, this thing's kind of heavy. Oh, there it is. Well, yeah, because they print, they print upside down, so to speak. Right. Which is fine. I just, I'm just not a, I'm kind of picky about design stuff, so I would rather not have a coupler. I mean, to me, a coupler is meant to hold something together, not to... Not Support to, weight. Yeah. Yeah, Chris asked if there's an antenna in the bag of parts. Let's get this bag of parts out onto a tray. Nice! Oh yeah, there it is. So this thing must have Wi-Fi built into it? I assume so, yeah. Assembly instructions. All right, so apparently we're supposed to put on the handle. So I'm just gonna stick the screw into that hole there. Then stick the screw through the other side of the hole and screw the handle in place. Oh, bud, he's all hyperactive because he met another friend. Oh, looks like the build platform is inside of the foam. Let's pull that out. Yeah, it's, I'm guessing that's the build platform. So what these printers do is they create layers of resin and then they build up instead of down like a 3D printer. Oh, thanks, Chris. Oh, these must be strainers for the resin. <clears throat> oh, it's got, looks like it's mostly cast aluminum and they've got some uh, steel uh, linear rails in the back. That's pretty good. Uh, let's see, Acme threaded rod. Yep, mm -hmm. most of this is aluminum. I mean, would you concur, Chris, just by feeling it? Yeah, it definitely feels like cast, but Yep, it's steel. But they're pointing... No, those can't... You think those are steppers? They might be some sort of... They look like... Well, they've got fans on them. Yeah. I would think there'd be a stepper down there, because the only thing this on thing needs to do is to bottom. go up. Yeah. I don't think this has the tilt function, the tilt and peel, like some of them do. Oh, okay. So what some of these machines will do is <clears throat> they'll do a layer, then they'll tilt slightly, and then go up, kind of like peeling a sticker off of something. Yeah. Because sometimes if they just go straight up, you lose the whole thing. Yeah, and that's what mine is. And this is what I was saying, where on mine, the motors are up here, mm -hmm. and there's two shafts. Oh, and you were, cause you were complaining about it dangling. Yeah, so it would be the equivalent of if the mortar was hitting, sitting here. Maybe when this comes up, we'll be able to, when this comes up, maybe we'll be able to see the coupling for it. Yeah. I wonder what these are, though. I mean, there's fans. They're obviously fans, but... There's a big honking UV light in there, and those are for the bulb. Oh, okay. Like a projector. The fans, I mean. Okay, well, I guess the next step is to fire it up and install the build plate, so... All right, it should it have power now, yeah. Turn it on? Yeah. Mm. Oh, there it goes. Full time. Okay, click Tools Move Z 10 millimeter up on the screen to raise the prep... platform? The Chris platform. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so... Tools? It's kind of... Oh, it's just got a really tight viewing, viewing angle. Well, it is at a slight angle backwards, which is good because, you know, you're not going to have, like, three-year-olds yeah. using this. Okay. I'm just saying like the viewing angle. Oh, okay. That's fine. Yeah. If you get off, off the edges at all, it's like. Just 10 millimeters. Oh, we need to go higher than that in order to, oh, this is where you put the resin and it's got a max line. It looks like you think there's like a protective film over it? Well, I see like air pockets, so there must be. It looks like there is. Well, I guess we'll look in the steps. I think we have to level, Z level it first. Yeah. Oh yeah, tear protective film off the LCD screen if you want to do that for fun while I... Okay. I mean, I know it's, it's very satisfying to do that, right? 
Aren't these screens usually a consumable? Like, does it say how to do it? Oh, th looks like there's a little tab over there on the yeah, right. Yeah, it does. But um, let me get let me get. Well, here here's a piece of plastic. But seeing it's an LCD screen, I I don't want to. It's a monochromatic LCD screen. Yeah, so we're trying to tear the protective film off the LCD screen, but it's I, I'm having trouble with it. Like, I don't know where the film starts or ends. There's like kind of like it feels mushy on the sides. Yeah, this part is a little is a little tricky because it's like. It shows him pulling it from that corner. It looks like a piece of tape down there. Tear off the protective film on the LCD. Yeah, that should be right here. Oh, wait, wait. But that picture also doesn't show this piece being there. Oh, no. <laughs> Did it say to remove it first? If you look at the picture, these things are, like, loosened up and... This, this is gone. Oh crap, maybe we are picking at the... Or maybe it'll be easier with that off. Yes. Yep, look at that, see? There you go. Yeah, I did not say to remove this in the instructions. No, it doesn't, no. All right, well that's not good. I just noticed because... Oh, it wasn't, you know, I saw this in the picture just sitting there, so... Oh yeah, see, and that's that film. Yep. So it's a good thing we figured out something was wrong. I'm assuming that, yeah, the part that we poked is outside of the print area. Yeah, yeah. But, okay, so any cubic, these instructions need to be better. Oh, yeah, it looks like it's put over there kind of like a drum with these screws. Yeah. Hoo, hoo, hoo. And that film is really important because it needs, the, the resin has to, you know, not stick to it. All right, well, that could have been better. It says here in step three, ensure it's clean, blah, blah, blah. Then install the resin vat. Resin vat? Okay. Which is this. Yeah. So, bum, bum, bum. Well, this is tight. Yeah. So it seems like, according to the instructions, this wasn't supposed to be pre-installed or it doesn't tell you to remove it. Yeah. First, because like this next, this aligning feature. So we're meant to flatten the build platform to the LCD, but without the resin vat. Okay. So I think this is supposed to represent the thickness of the consumable drum thing. Okay. Because, yeah, this yeah. is the next step, apparently. Tools, move Z, and then press the picture of a house for home. And then I assume it's going to rehome the Z. How does it know that it... This is with the thing attached, right? With the paper in there, yeah. And the plate. It's not going to crash, is it? I hope not. Finger press on the top of the platform gently, then tighten the screw to secure... The screw on the side or the screw yeah. on the top? Looks okay. like it's a combination. Yeah, it's the, well, yeah, because this one holds the plate in place onto the main arm, okay. and the one on the side sets the ball screw. Uh, actually, I think you're closer to it. You want to get it? <clears throat> That looks pretty good. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to hit home, which should squash it onto the paper. So it must have a, uh, like a current sense Z. Probably. I should know the brand. I feel guilty now. Well, yeah, you have a sham wow in the back of your car. Yeah. Chris and I were building 3D printers like what, like 11 years ago before it was cool? Yeah, <laughs> 2009, I think was when. The Mick Wire? Yeah. All right, pr click Z0 enter on the screen. My resin printers, I haven't had a lot of luck with. I mean, I've gotten, it's, an, I don't know. The whole process just seems well, the annoying post, to me. The post-processing is what I, because I used a Form 1. They sent me one yeah. back in the day. And yeah, the print quality is great. But yeah, sometimes, you know, the first layer of adhesion can be, it can be tricky yeah. or the particles. Yeah, really, for me, the issues I ran into were first layer adhesion, the, the resin getting out of whack because I didn't mix it well enough and and then just the fiddliness of the post-processing that I'm gonna you, go up some more you gotta wash it and then you gotta cure it and I mean it's fine but then and then it's the smell so you gotta decide like well some people and some people really love these like people that do like figurines oh or for like, sure you can't beat it for the quality of yeah. the print or uh, like jewelry shops yeah but I think the hang-up for me and you probably agree is that the kind of things I do, post-processing is not really 
it, it takes too much time for me because you know how I am. I just rip something right off the printer and stick it into whatever I'm building. I mean, a lot's changed. I haven't tried doing it in a while, so for all I know, the resin now smells like flowers, candy or something, you know. But when I originally was doing it, the resin smell was pretty awful. Let's huh. see. Okay. Install the resin vat until it aligns with the two screws in the panel. Oh, yeah, that's the way it came. Oh, wait. What? I turn it around but this way. The word max is toward the user. Oh. Right? Mm -hmm. Max okay. resin. Because to me, this is a pouring. Is there a max on this side? Oh, okay. Huh. No, I, I see your point, but yeah, it looks like the resin vat is hitting those screws in the back of it. Um, well, there were there were screw holes on the resin vat, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's where we got to line it up to. I mean, it's X Y position doesn't really matter as long as it's flat. Right. Thank so you, you bought an arm Mac, huh? I, I did. You can't resist, Chris. Well, I have a MacBook, like the 12 inch one mm -hmm. that I use just for kind of my general email and web surfing and writing computer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I don't do anything like, you know, crazy on it. Just Does it emulate it or how does it work? Yeah, so it has a built in code. In fact, they added like like actual hardware to the chip, to their ARM chip, yeah, that accelerates emulation. Yeah, because it's a reduced instruction set, which means it wouldn't have everything the x86 does. So for some things, it would require more cycles, right. wouldn't it? But, but like they have this uh, translator called Rosetta. They had it for the PowerPC to Intel transition. Oh yeah. And they have the second version of it, Rosetta Two. Whatever. Well, they just wanted to make their own silicon so they can make more money. That's. It has well, nothing to do with perform. Well, I guess it does. Well, no, it does. Be I mean, it's not strictly about money. I mean, yeah, it's great that they. Oh, make it's money. Apple, Chris. But but the thing you have to understand is, is that that when they s transitioned from PowerPC to Intel, mm -hmm. it was because PowerPC basically no one cared about what they needed because they were considered such a small market. Apple. Yeah, so even... You know, yeah, but PowerPC was being used in all the consoles at that time. Yeah, but still, like, Apple, it was like, Apple says, hey, we need a new chip every year. And they and they just laugh and say, well, sorry, go make your own or whatever. So Intel courted them and said, hey, we can help you out. So the thing is, Apple wants a new model every year. But Intel has had trouble delivering mobile chips. So we have translucent green and skin color. I could print a new cat. <laughs> so what were you saying about the chips and Intel? Oh, but before we get into that, shake them more than you think you should have to shake them. That's what I learned about resin. Yeah, so tell us, finish your story while I shake them. Yeah, so Apple wants a new product every year. And Intel, in the last few years, has had troubles delivering mobile chips on a kind of a routine schedule basis. So I... Apple is absolutely interested in making loads and loads of money and controlling all aspects of the of the you know of the supply chain helps them do that. Yeah, having verticals. But they they would have been happy to let someone else supply them with chips if they would have gotten what they wanted on a regular basis, which was a new chip every year that was more powerful and more efficient than the chips from the previous. This has the test file, you want to plug it in? I think it's on your side. Uh, oh, so basically Intel wasn't making enough new stuff for them. Right. And and when Apple says, hey, we need something, well, they're only like, what, 8% of the market? So Intel doesn't really even care. You know, like Apple's a small-time customer, so... Right, but if Apple <clears throat> rolls its own ARM chip with the license of ARM, then they can just get a fab to make it for them. Yeah, and, <clears throat> and Apple was already having their own ARM chips being made for the iPad and the iPhone. Right. And Apple is a founding member of, of ARM, so they get access to the ARM cores without having to pay for them. Really? Basically. I did not know that. Tonight on Bar Rescue! Don't shake your drinks toward the customer, shake them away from the customer! So we should start with the skin color because it's not translucent. Right. You know, skin is technically translucent. <clears throat> That's true. It's also the biggest organ in the body, I think. It smells like latex. You want to smell it? Yeah. Hmm. It's not as bad as the stuff that I've... 
had in the past. Yeah, it smells like paint. All right, I'm gonna fill and not go. Oh, it does look like skin. <laughs> oh, it's got bubbles from stirring. Maybe we should let it sit for a bit. Yeah. Oh, what's that thing called? A degasser? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. I think it's a vacuum basically to pull all the one. air. Yeah. Oh, you do? Yeah. Oh, you should have brought it. Uh, do you remember that toy in the nine, like 91 where it was like the Terminator 2 toy with the skin of a girl on the exoskeleton? Mm -hmm. No. It was oh. like, it's funny because they got like these like nine year old boys advertising the toy for the R rated movie. And it was like, they saw, they, there was like an endoskeleton, right? And you put it in this mold and then you would eject this pink skin around it. Okay. And then you could tear off the skin like battle damage. Okay. That's what that reminds me of. Oh. I, yeah, I guess I wasn't, uh, or I was already too old. But we had um, the Monster Maker. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the Monster Maker 2, which came out like later once the company figured out a way of building them without getting sued. That's where you're... They asked your friend Max where uh, they should fill it to, and he said... Max, who doesn't get HBO Max for free, that was another joke. <laughs> well, no, but the displacement of this in the liquid, that's probably why I have the Max line. Because, you know, this... You know, it's gonna make the liquid yeah, go up. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, who's that guy who said Eureka? You know, in history? Yeah. The guy figured out, oh yeah, because he was trying to figure out how, like, the displacement of gold, right? Yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. I oh, who know. was that? That wasn't, that wasn't Newton, was it? It was somebody no, else. No, 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 no. It was much earlier. Because he, he was also the guy who allegedly came up with a death ray. No, it wasn't Tesla. No, 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 no. A death ray, like, uh... Um, Archimedes? Archimedes? No, this was after Archimedes, wasn't it? It was it basically it was someone who realized that their body displaced a certain amount of mass in a tub, and they realized they could use that to detect yeah, gold. Archimedes. That was Archimedes. Yeah. Man, I didn't realize it was that long ago. But my understanding is is he also like was the guy who came up with the idea of um, using mirrors to reflect sunlight, and then and then oh, his death ray. Yeah. Yeah, death the, ray. MythBusters did an episode about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Although I don't really, I don't really agree with the way they did it. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it a shot. Okay. How long does it sit? Does it say in here how long to let it sit? After? Uh, it doesn't. Okay. I'm sure all those bubbles will get squished out. Uh, let's see what happens. I was thinking, like, if you had the Archimedes death ray, instead of just shining a bunch of mirrors at a boat. What if you shown a bunch of mirrors at a central mirror and then had that mirror aim at the boat? Yeah. Kind of like you know how like you have a satellite dish. Right? right, and the right. satellite dish takes the signals and then it points it into the main receiver. Then that actually was what goes into your TV. Yeah. So you, if you build like a satellite dish, that way you could basically aim it. it well, also that's how like you know how like a telescope works. Well, like, even the light they reflects into the solar heaters that work that way because they use they they have a it's a dish. Yeah. And then but it's made of a mirror, and then at the focal point you'd have that much have, more area of sunlight. They have a salt. A, 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 it's like a chamber of salt, and then the heat gets so hot that it melts the salt. Salt becomes liquid salt, mm -hmm. and then that circulates through a system, you know, and then the heat becomes. Oh, so they use salt so it carries more uh, energy. Yeah, yeah, heat and it, energy. It, it, it's not like because water would vaporize right away, where salt, it's like right. it takes so much more. Well, heat. it's a metal. Yeah, that makes sense. But I'm just saying, like that concept. There's, you know, even the the um, the ones you see out in the desert where they have thousands. Yeah, thousands they concentrated into one point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. That's I think Mythbusters Mythbuster should have done the Archimedes death ray that way. Yeah. Because yeah, you concentrate into one point in the center, but it would be kind of like a backwards dish. So if like if this is your if this is your, um, you know, your like a satellite dish that's got all the mirrors in it, and then the mirrors would coalesce into a point out here, and then there'd be a hole in the center, and then that would reflect forward. Right. That way you wouldn't have to adjust all the mirrors, you just adjust the whole thing to aim the laser beam. Right. Well, it's not a laser, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I thought Mythbusters, I thought they could have done better with that one. Oh, yeah. They didn't put enough thought into there, it. There was a bunch of episodes where you could tell they kind of... I mean, they're cool and all, but they're no Archimedes. Yeah. I mean, it's a neat little unit. I mean, it's, it's really yeah, compact. Yeah. 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 And in the screen here, it says we're on layer four of 1400. And then it looks like it's depicting what the current layer is. So the way these um, uh, LCD 
resin printers work is they, they have an LCD in here, and as you may or may not know, LCDs are transparent, right? So like your television, there's a backlight, and the backlight shines or doesn't shine through the liquid crystal display. So light either goes through or it doesn't, right? So what they do with this thing is they just have a big UV bulb and it shines through the LCD. So the LCD per layer just creates a black or white image that either allows the UV light to pass through or prevents it from passing through. Now that's in comparison to like the form lab, like the form one that I used on the show where that actually had a, a UV laser and a galvo. Yeah. And well, galvanometer, that would be a mirror on two axes, right? So the laser, the static laser would shoot at the at the mirror, then the mirror would basically paint, kind of like those DJ light effects. So it would raster it, so it would go But it took longer because you're having to rasterize all the bits. Whereas this one does one layer all in one shot because it's just LCD image. So it's like a stack of UV cured images. Yeah, no, almost, you know, this is gonna sound weird, but it, I swear I smell like almost a hint of- Nutmeg? No, PVA glue. Yeah, I could, no, I could see that. Yeah. Oh, hey, man, let's sniff this. It's party time. It's very quiet. Hey, look at this foam packaging, Chris. This looks like a 3D print. Look, it's a bunch of pieces. It's a bunch of, like, what? Probably six millimeter pieces stacked atop each other to make a custom... Uh, it's 3D printed styrofoam. Well, I guess we could look at the washing machine portion, Chris, while this prints. Okay. Oh, yeah, Chris is here because he was dropping off an Atari 800, right? Yes, Atari 800. For what, Stuart, who lives actually just not too far from here? Yeah. So I'm sure I've told you, like, outside of conventions, Menards is the place I get noticed the most in real life. So I was at Menards, I don't know, last week, and some guy's like, Ben Heckendorn? And I'm like, oh, yeah, Menards. But then it was your, your friend Stuart. And he's like, when's Chris going to get me that printer? <laughs> or that that, that that computer. Yeah, yeah. It's been a rough year, so. Well, yeah, because you had a <clears throat> medical medical problem. Yeah. yeah. Oh, look at that. Oh, those must be infrared LED lights. See that bar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, this must have that spinning thing like they have in like the laboratories, you know, to spin the, uh, you know, like. Yeah. yeah. And yet, this is just it's one like, piece. It's like a little dishwasher. Yeah. Oh yeah, so look, here's the magnetic thing. See? Yeah, but it's not not magnetic. Is it magnetic? Oh, it'd have to be. Where does it stick through? Oh, it's got like little LEDs in the front of it, see? Oh yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, there's this disc that has this. Oh, so, oh. Yeah, so like, it's like on display. That's cool. And then this, I assume probably, oh yeah, would use magnetism yeah. to rotate the, um, the dishwashing. Okay, so. Oh, this is probably to reflect back up to the object. Yeah, I bet it's like this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, to get it from underneath. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah, there's definitely a shape. Two hours left. Yeah, it looks like we can either put the whole build platform in or put it in upside down. Oh, no, it's an extender ring. Oh, yeah. So I guess in any case, you put it in attached to the platform upside down. Oh, yeah, you love liquids, don't you, bud? Well, that gets us almost there. Yeah. I think about half about the, half of this one. Oh, I guess it's in milliliters, so we could have just done the math. <laughs> I'm going to try wash mode. Two minutes. Okay, now it's starting. Oh, yeah, the thing's spinning. It sounded like it has a stepper in it. Did you hear that that noise? Yeah. Oh, look, it's making like a little uh, little tornado. Yeah. I'll get you, Dorothy. Oh, you can start to see the shape inside. Well, Chris had to go. His home planet needed him. But I wrote 8K of random data to this EEPROM. I'm going to see if I can erase it with this machine. I mean, I still got like an hour to wait before the actual print finishes. Um, yeah, you can see the um, process now. So it zaps one layer, then it goes up, then it goes back down, but not quite as far down, and then it zaps the next layer. So it's really, yeah, it's kind of printing upside down. The EEPROM cooking away. I mean, why not? Got nothing else to do while we wait for this to print. Actually, I should make, make some supper. I don't know what, though. I know what I'll make!
I'll use that recipe from that cowboy cooking channel and make my own deep fried corn dogs and then I won't share them with Bud. So yeah, I've got corn muffin mix, beef hot dogs, bamboo sticks, cornmeal, flour, and breadcrumbs. Now you might be thinking, what does this have to do with 3D printers? The answer is absolutely nothing. I just don't care. Ben's trying to troll us. It's like, yeah, pretty much. Oh yeah, let's use up the last of the cornmeal. Hope there's no beevils in it. Eh, a few little breadcrumbs. Of course, that's a different kind of consistency. Uh, cornmeal mix. I think I got, where did this come from? I don't know, the store? Did I buy this at Goodwill? Sometimes Goodwill has good prices on like corned beef hash. Although corned beef hash isn't very good for me. Eh, that's probably enough. Oh, what else do we need in this? Probably, do I have any nutmeg? Oh, I usually, have, oh yeah, there it is, brown nutmeg. Oh, 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 oh that's probably plenty. Uh, so some garlic powder. I'm so glad Bud doesn't realize that he can totally jump up under this counter yet. He's gonna figure it out eventually. <sighs> That'll be the end of an era. The end of my kitchen independence. This will be Kitchen Pendence Day. Oh, we need an egg as a binding agent. Do you know I can do this? Yes, I can crack eggs with one hand. Uh, when you're making a batter like this for deep frying, be it a corn dog or fish, um, the consistency is really important because you want it to stick to your food object, but you don't want it to uh, be so thick that it takes forever to cook the food underneath it. Then you end up with like a burnt uh, crust. I'm going to be using this Dutch oven. Dutch oven is basically a cast iron pot that's coated with enamel. Our sticks need to fit inside of the Dutch oven. Let's use these big, oh yeah, oh yeah. No wackas. Okay, we're gonna want the wieners to be as dry as possible. Can the Anycubic wash and cure machine erase an EEPROM in 15 minutes? Leave Virginia alone. Leave Virginia alone. All right, let's try to reprogram it. Oh, uh, it didn't work. Well, it's worth a shot. And we're back with Ben's cooking show. All right, so I've got my cast iron Dutch oven here. It does have a lot of particulates in it. It might look gross, but that's what the bottom of your local greasy spoon looks like anyway. It's usually the grease is so dirty you can't even see it. This should be fine. So I'm gonna cook this at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. They should do a, a bar rescue Kitchen Nightmares expanded universe. I and mean, there's probably a lot of bars to rescue now. Oh crap, I'm out of vegetable oil. I'll just, I'll just add olive oil to it. Whoa! Good thing it wasn't hot. Oil is oil, right? It's not like oil and water, it's oil and oil. So I actually use my IR thermometer to get the temperature of this. That also allows me to play with Bud. Hey Bud. You're being really needy today. <gasps> What's that? <gasps> Whoa, I get it! How high can you jump? How high can you jump? Yeah, we got about an hour left on that print. Plenty of time to make these uh, homemade corn dogs. So uh, this is a gas stove, so we need to be extra careful with the, um, the oil, right? And then you're probably saying, oh, but you got paper towels right next to the flame. That'll be fine. Yeah, so we don't want to have any splatter, so we're going to I actually, when I was a teenager, I used to work in a restaurant, so I used to work a lot of Friday night fish fries, so I'm pretty used to it. Um, you just kind of ease the piece in. Well, we'll do that when, when it gets heated up. Oh, what's Ben doing on his uh, channel this weekend? Hi, ah, skewering wieners? I think it's time to unsubscribe. So in the cowboy cooking video, he said to put the batter into like a, a jar or a glass so you can roll the... Um, the hot dog inside of it. So I'm gonna use my big, giant, dangerous beer drinking mug. Okay, 235. I'm probably gonna go like 375, uh, a little bit over, because as soon as we drop stuff in, there's gonna be a lot of exothermic heat loss. 
I guess it's kind of redundant, isn't it? All right, we're getting into the 370s. I think it's about time to give this a shot. Let's see what happens. I'm going to roll the corn dog like so. Drip it off a bit. In it goes. And the second one. Uh, I'm going to do about, I don't know, four minutes, I think. Yeah, one of them appears to have opened up a fissure in the uh, in the side of the corn dog. The other one is quite intact. Perhaps I should have done some light scoring on the hot dog to make the batter stick better. Yeah, let's do a halfway flip. Oh, that one had like an explosion. I don't know if it's a taste explosion. It's more like a Chernobyl explosion. Well, I think I'm going to cook one more, but in the meantime, let's take a look at this one. This is the one that looked more proper. Okay. It's the hot dog itself. Well, of course, hot dogs are pre-cooked. I guess the question is, is the hot dog, is the hot dog warm? It should be. Okay, yeah. Hot dog is warm enough. I'm just going to try the crust by itself. It's pretty decent. To maybe use a little bit more um, cornmeal taste. All right, now I'm going to try it with the breading and the corn dog. Hopefully, I don't burn my mouth. It's pretty good. This darker color could be a result of the um, um, the uh, what was it? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, the the breadcrumbs that I put in. Let's try it with some ketchup. It's definitely a lighter, flakier crust than you'd get with like a frozen corn dog. You know, it tastes closer to like, you know, like Friday night fish fry fish in texture. Yeah, see the crust just slid off the hot dog. So I wonder if I should lacerate the hot dog to give it more surface area. Kind of like glue, you know. Um, I just tested the other one that, you know, kind of exploded. Um, I think it could use... Um, slightly thicker um, batter. Uh, so I think what's happening is the batter is cooking too quickly and on top of that um, as you saw it was kind of dark and that's not just because of the temperature it's also because there was a lot of cornmeal in it. So I think maybe if I do it with more uh, flour that might help lighten the color of it. Uh, yeah well except for the bits of uh, dirty particles stuck to it we can see this one already has a much lighter color. Eh, that's carbon. We just eat it right off. Who cares? Yeah, so we increased the flour content. And also, I made the batter a little thicker. That means it will cook slower, which means it won't get as crispy as the other uh, corn dogs were. Ah, now look at that. That's got the color that we want. That looks like a corn dog. That looks like the cup of a carpenter. That's what Indiana Jones would say. Okay, let's make sure it's fully cooked. Yep, the um, the breading is fully cooked. Let's get the temperature of the hot dog. Perfectly sufficient. Let's get the temperature of the coating. Mmm, that's good. Yeah, so I made it a thicker batter. And I cooked it a little longer, about four minutes, because, you know, it's going to take longer for the heat to get to the dog itself. Oh, look at that. That is proper. That, I'm going to take a bite without ketchup. Mmm. Well, I got something to think about. Obviously, the cornmeal would expand a little bit. I didn't put any baking uh, powder in this, but definitely looks a little thicker than it was when it went on. That's really good. I probably could have cooked it a little bit longer. There's a bit of doughiness, but it's not really a big deal. Hmm. And by the way, that print downstairs is probably down to about 40 minutes, so I'll be able to look at that pretty soon, too. <laughs> so, yeah. If you want to make some uh, county fair style corn dogs, if you have a way to deep fry them, Dutch oven, fry daddy, uh, yeah, give that a shot. Just remember, um, 
Don't do it entirely with uh, cornmeal. Uh, be sure to put some flour in there because the cornmeal will get a little crunchy. Oh yeah, so delicious. I actually really enjoy cooking. I know I don't really talk about that on my channel, but yeah, I really enjoy cooking. That's something that I really like to do, especially for other people. Okay, it seems to be done. There's our part. So it's got a little bit dripping at the bottom. I believe we remove this. Yeah. There's what we printed. I'm gonna put on the washer basin like that. Okay. I believe we put our part down in and it should, yep, it's fully submerged. I have a washing machine, Dwight. Yeah, I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but you can definitely see some of the material um, or the liquid going into the water. So I'm going to let this run for 10 minutes and then we'll uh, hit it with the UV. Okay, there's our washed model uh, skin color. Yeah, you can see it's still it's moving a little bit because there's not much that actually connects it. I guess this is what we're supposed to use the spatula for. Okay. Oh, that wasn't too difficult to come off. Okay, let's put it in place. And we're gonna put on the protective lid. I don't know if this is protecting the part or us. Cure, I'm gonna do, yeah, I'll do 10 minutes again. Yeah, I've seen other people, they'll take like a, a you know, like a can or a container and line it with UV lights and bake it in there. But I like how this is like an all-in-one solution, like the same uh, machine that can uh, wash it can also uh, dry it. So it's kind of like a washer and dryer unit in one. So I put the build platform back into the machine and tightened the uh, top screw. Now, if you recall, we leveled it before and tightened this other screw to basically make this uh, level with the build or the LCD platform. So I'm kind of wondering if we actually need to re -Z it or as long as this screw over here stays tight if we're good. I guess we'll find out when we do our follow-up print. And here it is after being cured for 10 minutes. Uh, it's still a little wet with the alcohol, but uh, yeah, let's test the base. Yeah, it's got a little bit of flex, but okay. You can break it if you try. So, well, wanted to try it out. 35 millimeters, okay. All right, well, if you force it, it will break. Of course, that's, you know, it's resin. It's different than, you know, a standard 3D printer. Uh, yeah, I mean, you really can't see any lines at all. It's um, pretty high resolution. I've had to guess it's probably like point, well, point oh five millimeter layer height. Do you have some deformation right there? Not sure, okay, that was, okay, so that was, we printed like that, right? Uh, but yeah, that was a uh, pretty easy to clean up. You know, it's pretty much automatic and you don't even really have to get your hands dirty at all. You just stick it into the thing and it removed from the build platform pretty easily. Uh, I know I had some problems with that on the uh, Form Labs printer that I tested years ago. I would actually put a strip of uh, uh, scotch tape on the bottom and then you'd actually peel up the tape to help you remove the platform. But this seemed to come up pretty well. And obviously this, this type of design doesn't require any supports because, you know, it's designed to print in place. Uh, yeah, most of the lines are pretty straight. There is some deformation, but yeah, it worked out pretty well. So yeah, it just took about three and a half hours to print, but the post-processing with the washing machine was pretty easy. So what I'm going to do next is design my own file and then try it out in the Photon software, and then we'll try sending it over to the printer using Wi-Fi. Here's Photon Workshop. This is what you're supposed to use to actually generate the files. Now it looks like you can't actually send these over Wi-Fi to the printer. The Wi-Fi antenna on the back of the printer is just for cell phone monitoring and control. So that's disappointing. Uh, it would be really nice if you could like just drag and drop this across your network onto the printer. But as is, it seems like I'm going to have to use a USB stick. Okay, um, so we have configured machine type Photon S, Photon, Photon Zero. 
So uh, that's a little confusing. What's the difference between the S and the photon? Not sure. I'm just going to go with photon. So we're using the photon mono SE. Now mono refers to the color or lack thereof <laughs> with the LCD. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go, I think, oh, what was this? Uh, 130 by 78 by 160 millimeter build volume. I think what I'll do is I'll go into Fusion and design something that the kind of thing I would want, and then we'll lay it out here. And I've got good old Fusion 360 here. Let's create a sketch. Oh, and we're going to want to be in uh, millimeters. I noticed the Photon software. I'm, I'm spoiled by, uh, uh, what's it called? Simplify 3D. Simplify 3D um, automatically detects what units you're in. Most software doesn't, so if you put in something in inches, it appears really tiny because the machines are all metric, of course. Now, if you remember, uh, we were trying to pick at that, um, we were trying to pick through the, the build plastic to get at the um, LCD, you know, the thing that would lift off the LCD plastic. So there might be a kind of a ding in that corner, so I don't want to get too close to it. But hey, they should have said, hey, remove this first. See, I'm just, I'm just assigning all the blame to them. <laughs> yes. Um, so let's make, I mean, I'm not going to, let's just make like a, a fakey calculator. How about that? Because you know, I love me, my calculators. Long time ago, I had a woman to love. She made me think of things I never thought of. Now she's gone and I'm on my own. A love song is going through my mind. When I become president someday, my first executive order that all radio stations have to realize there are more meatloaf songs than just paradise by the dashboard lights. So if it's, I have to give it like some sort of name, like, you know, like an acronym, like a, like a backronym, you know, where you come up with the acronym first and then you figure out what it means. Like the, the cares act, which was the first, um, uh, stimulus package. They're like, Oh, okay. It's, it's called the cares act. What's it stand for? You know, everyone talks about how cool Jean Favreau is, but we have to remember Jean Favreau was a person who said, you know what this movie needs less of? It needs less Jeremy Irons. I'm sorry, who says that? Now, speaking of Jeremy Irons, if you watch uh, Lion King, the original version, he's singing that song about being prepared. At the end of the song, I don't know what it was. It was something like Jeremy Irons, his like, I don't know, he, he had a cold or something. So the f finale of that song, it's actually performed by a different actor. It's um, uh, Jim Cummings, who is like, does voices for everything. Uh, uh, he was uh, Darkwing Duck, for instance. So yeah, if you, if you, listen, if you watch that movie, um, Scar's voice changes for like the final uh, verse of that song. Although Jim Cummings is a pretty good uh, Jeremy Irons impression. They bought it. Hook. Line und sinker. That was my diehard three impression. All right, so I hollowed out the case. And I'm adding these, these pegs here. This is so, because remember, this is going to print upside down. So I, just like a FDM printer, I have to think about the way in which it prints, right? So I'm not sure if you can just have this big thing flapping in the breeze because it, well, it's the opposite of a, the way an FDM printer works, you have to make sure everything's supported. So what I want to do is I want to have these pegs here, and then I'm going to put a cross support. So hopefully that will make sure, because when this prints, well, actually here, we can do a cross-section analysis. Uh, one thing that'll be nice about this kind of printing process is something like a 0.5 millimeter um, fillet will actually resolve. You know, you'll actually be able to see it in the print quality. You think like you go into Disney and you're like, I've got a great idea for a movie. What is it? Let's make Hamlet in Africa. It's like, we've already done that three times. You had Lion King, uh, Black Panther, and then Lion King, the remake. I don't, need, I don't need to watch it to know why it will be an emotionless train wreck is because animals do not have eyebrows, right? And actually, and... Uh, cats don't even really have eyelids. Well, they have an inner eyelid, but it doesn't work the way our eyelids do. Like, when an animal blinks, it scrunches the muscles in its face around its eye, whereas 
humans, we have that thin flap that goes down over our eyes. So if you make a photorealistic line, it can't, it can't blink like we do. It can't raise its eyebrows. It's just biologically less expressive. And that's why when CGI Simba looks at CGI Mufasa falling into a CGI wildebeest herd, it's like, it's just, it just looks like a, li a lion at the zoo, you know, staring at a tourist. Well, uh, well it wouldn't be 12 millimeters because they're, they're not as tall as they are wide. Right, I'm going to grab this on the inside. Same thing. I'm going to do a pattern, pattern on path. Something I uh, sometimes struggle with is, um, you know, depending on what projects I'm working on, because, you know, I, I say that I'm semi-retired, but it's not like I ever stopped, you know, uh, building things or making things or doing, you know, pay projects. Um, sometimes you'll, uh, your skills at something will, uh, I suppose, atrophied is a good word, where you kind of, you kind of forget how to do it. And I kind of have that problem sometimes. Like, like it's been a while since I've done a lot of fusion work, you know? So it's like, oh man, I got to remember how to do this. I'm going to do this a little differently. I'm going to take my button here and I'm going to extrude it forward uh, 0.1 inch. Or stand and face the hounds of hell and rot inside a corpse's shell. And though you fight to stay alive, your body starts to shiver. For no mere mortal can resist the evil of the thriller. <laughs> um, so I actually put the post uh, kind of between the buttons. Speaking of fillets, let's put a little bit of a fillet on the front of this. Eh, probably not that much uh, around the LCD. So let's grab uh, this sketch, edit sketch, and then I'm going to do an offset around this. And I'm going to do about half the distance to the um, fillet. I'll go 2.5. I mean, if I was doing this for real, I would try to use the um, <clears throat> golden ratio. So this is the kind of thing that you couldn't really do with a FDM printer. So I'm going to extrude this just a little bit because, again, it's going to be printing upside down, so it, it shouldn't make a difference. And again, this is just a faux calculator, which is... Uh... <laughs> faux is just French for fake, you know. Well, we can't call this a fake diamond ring. Oh, but what if we use the French word for fake? Oh, well, that's okay then. We can use that. Um, so yeah, maybe one application of this is, um, you know, we could use this to make an inset for like a plastic covering. Actually, yeah, we could do that. We could cut some 1 16th inch uh, plastic on my laser. Well, we really shouldn't do a fillet and a chamfer, but actually that doesn't look that it. Oh yeah, because you're holding onto the side of the calculator. Dave Jones would be like, it's a beauty. It's my calculator. Oh, no, he didn't make a calculator. He made a, a multimeter. Multimeter, multimeter. Let's go in and put a little bit of a chamfer on the mating edge. This would be like the glamour line. Um, basically, you'd have a little, uh, you, pu you purposely make like an indent where the case goes together so that the owner can't tell that it's not a perfect fit. It kind of hides the inaccuracy. Glamour line. Oh yeah, maybe we could make something down here for like where a sticker would go. So I can do this. I can actually make a new sketch, which will give me the curve, right? And then, okay, if we want to be, if we want to be right about this, okay. So we want to, yeah, we want to come in the same distance as the button. So that is uh, that is obscured millimeters, three millimeters. Okay. So we would do this. We'd get the offset of here. We'd come in negative three millimeters, right? And then we would draw a line here and guess how many? Yes, that's right, three millimeters. There we go. Finish sketch, bring it up this way. And then what is this, two millimeters thick? Let's do a 0.5 millimeter. See, that probably wouldn't even resolve if it was an FDM. So, and then we wanna get really fancy smancy. We can do a 0.5 millimeter chamfer to make it kind of like an entry for the sticker. So yeah, you could put like a sticker there. Um, I thought this, you know, let's just try to drag it in. Oh, there we go. I guess I flew too close to the sun. 
the file wasn't supported by that printer. But then uh, by reading the online manual, it says, oh, the software is on the included USB stick that had the demo file. So sure enough, slicing software, Photon Workshop V2123X64. So I installed that one. And then now machine type, I've got the Mono SE, which is what I have. Oh, then look, it's a bigger work area. Uh, okay. So again, the documentation could be a little better. I mean, you know, it's one thing to have documentation like this if it's like, oh, I don't know, like a big tree tech. Oh, there we go. That's kind of weird. Yeah, the older version, you could, you could drag and drop. This one, you can't. Oh, oh they've got uh, blue on gray. That's uh, kind of a design fail. Oh, look, now it fits. Yahoo. All right, I'm going to export this. Okay, yeah, PWM. Possumus Woman. <laughs> PWMS. Yeah, so I'm going to put that onto the USB stick, and then it should, this time it should work. 26 minutes. So something like this, uh, resin printer is actually more advantageous for, because um, since it's doing it with an LCD, not a uh, Galvo beam, it can do an entire layer. You know, no matter how much stuff is on one layer, it takes the same amount of time to expose it. So something like this, where the 3D printer would be going, you know, going all around it, something that's wide and thin, you're actually at a time advantage on a resin printer. The online manual does tell you to remove the uh, resin bin before you try to peel the LCD uh, protective film off. Um, so yeah, again, so the online manual says, oh, remove, yeah, take out the printing platform, blah, 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 then remove the LCD film. So Again, the instructions, they, they are, they're all someplace, but they're all not in the same place. So I think that could be streamlined a bit. So I put the head back in place by tightening this screw. I did not readjust the leveling because I would hope that you don't have to do that every time. So I'm just going to go for it with this new print. So yeah, we can see on the screen, that's what it's printing. So yeah, it's starting, yeah, it's starting with the, uh, the edges and then all the supports and then it'll work its way up. Bud, are you jealous because I was hanging out with another human yesterday instead of you? <laughs> I got you now! Ah! <laughs> okay, it's done. Let's take a look. Uh, that, uh, that did not print successfully. Oh, and this isn't good. The resin has leaked. Uh, uh, what happened? Did... Um, that's not good. <sighs> yeah, you can see the uh, front of the calculator was adhering to the bottom, but apparently, maybe? So here's from the wash. Yeah, um, the base of it stuck, but something happened along the way. Yeah, like a good half millimeter of it got stuck underneath the build platform on the LCD. I carefully removed it. Okay, I reprinted it. I actually put a piece of scotch tape over that hole. Hopefully that <laughs> sealed it. I contacted Anycubic about where I can buy replacement uh, film. That looks like it printed correctly, although there's some stuff hanging off the side. Well, let's wash it. All right, it looks like the scotch tape stopped the leak. That's good. I guess my advice would be if they ship it with the, um, the resin base already installed, then the, why not just peel the, why can't they just peel the film off of, the protective film off the LCD? Or change the instruction manual. But uh, yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm gonna try to get some replacement film for the bottom of the uh, resin basin, but okay, I'm curing some small push buttons that should fit into the calculator. Even though the calculator didn't print correctly, we can still see what the interference or the tolerance is for the buttons. It's a uh, 0.0, no, not 0. 0.0. It's 0. 0.75 millimeters uh, tolerance. So we'll see how accurate that ends up being. Also, one thing I've tried is um, re-leveling uh, it with each print. I'm actually not sure if you're supposed to do that or not. I suppose I should like read the manual better. Because there are definitely some things that aren't covered in the quick start card, like the Wi-Fi, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Oh yeah, uh, some printing issues. Oh wait, I can just... Yeah, the supports seem to have some issues, but I can just try it from the other side. Yeah, still fits fine. So yeah, you definitely have much better tolerances than you would with, uh, you know, FDM printing. 
I think the issue with this is <clears throat> I'm, I'm just not experienced enough with um, this type of printing. See how these, this delaminated here? I think it's because of how I printed it. So I need to do some more research as to how to print something like this. But we can see the tolerance is really good. And small things like these buttons work just fine. So for me, I'm not into like, um, you know, board games or anything like that. So I would be interested in making like, like calculators or watches or, you know, just kind of like mechanical things with high detail. I mean, like the finish is really nice. It looks almost like injected molded plastic. Like the fact that you can kind of see some of the witness marks. Well, that's not the correct term of witness marks necessarily, but you know, you can see you can kind of see remnants of this structure in the front, which is reminiscent of uh, ABS plastic. And that half a millimeter indent for sticker, that, that printed perfectly. Yeah, just I, I need to, I, I think I probably need to print it like this. I think that's usually how it's done. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna print up my pie buttons and then we can UV them and paint them and see how that looks. So here's a test print that I did. It has a hex kind of nut on the bottom with a uh, a chamfer that allows it to be easily pried off of the surface. And yeah, it finished up really nice. There's kind of like this um, like white milkiness. I know that maybe, I guess that's from the um, UV. I also wonder, um, there is a little bit of first layer compression, much like you'd have with a 3D printer. So I wonder if I need to adjust the Z a little bit. Uh, let's see how strong these things are. Eh, that's not bad. <clears throat> Okay, there. That took a good amount of force to break. And then it shatters into a million pieces. Right, so the thumbstick that comes with the printer, it actually has um, the most recent version of the software. That's what I actually installed on my computer. And also a Wi-Fi app. This folder um, contains the APK, if you want to just manually drag it onto your phone. And then the Wi-Fi text file. So if you load this up, um, when I... Uh, Mine had like some weird characters. I don't know if it's because it was like from China or something. So I actually had to type this in manually and I used the, um, well, there's there's a couple different manuals. There was um, the, so there's uh, two user manuals. There's the Anycubic 3D manual. Then there's a manual specific to the printer that you bought. So if you look in the general manual, this one will talk about the Wi-Fi settings. Ah, here it is. My SD card had this, it was some sort of like Unicode or some weird language. So I actually had to type this in manually. Wi-Fi account, colon, no space, wireless name, comma, carriage return, Wi-Fi password, no space, the password, comma, settings, colon, one, comma, which means there is a password. And so obviously you would never use the no password version. Uh, yeah, so I typed that in and then I saved it. It doesn't really matter where. And then what you do is you go on the printer and you run this file. Let me show you. So after you've changed the Wi-Fi text file, you stick the USB stick into your AnyCubic, then you go to print and you actually have to print the Wi-Fi file and that will set it up. And then you go back to tools. Oh, I'm sorry. Power, PowerPoint. And it will set up everything in the Wi-Fi right here and it should give you the IP address. And you can type that into the app and then you can connect. You can go onto Anycubic's website and just download the APK with your phone, then execute the APK and then it will install it, at least onto Android. And what you do is you basically just, uh, you get the IP address off of the printer and then you can link it to your phone. So this allows you to select what file you want to print. It'll show you what's on the USB stick and then allow you to activate the print or see the time remaining. Um, it doesn't allow you to send prints over Wi-Fi as far as I can tell, which I would say that's a negative. It would be really nice if I could connect to this with the um, the software, the Photon software on my PC and send prints. But I don't know, you know, since prints take a long time, it's nice that you can like update it. However, it uses the local IP address, which means if I went to like go have a drink and watch the Packers lose, um, I wouldn't be able to keep track of it. I've got our muddy liquid, but it says you can do like 50 washes, so I guess we'll see. Yeah, I like this wash station. Um, you know, it's like having a washing machine versus like having to slap your clothes against a rock. <laughs> it just makes it convenient. Uh, while that rinses, I do have some other feedback here. Um, so the tub is put in place with these set screws, which go into divots on the top surface. 
Oh, and I like how it's all aluminum. That's neat. But uh, it would be nice if there was some sort of like indicator to show like the depth. Oh, there's a magnet. You know, to show how far you need to slide it in. Because once you put the set screws in place, you can't really see if it's lined up to the divots or not. Right? So if there was some sort of like just ridge or some sort of mark here in the aluminum, then you would know how far to push the bin back and also that it's uh, level. It looks like one of those like organic smoothie makers now, right? Mmm, it's gonna be good. Obviously you can smell it, but it doesn't smell bad. It smells like latex paint. I mean, you know, it's not like it has no smell, but it, I would, it's certainly not a noxious smell. I don't know if the build volume's gonna be big enough for the programmer's calculator I wanted to make. Um, it's on my project list. I wanna make a programmer's calculator, kind of like which you can get on your phone. Um, so there's like dedicated uh, zero through F hex buttons, dedicated zero through nine decimal, and then zero and one for binary. So as soon as you push that button, it switches modes. I thought it'd be cool to make a calculator like that. I'm gonna make a Pi key in the meantime. So I've got some, just some standard black acrylic paint, some rubbing alcohol and some Q-tips, and we'll see what we can do. I gave the buttons a slight curve. Can you see that? And I think what we can do once we print a few more things is look at it with my microscope. And we should be able to see the striations, but yeah, they're going to be a lot less obvious than they are on a standard FDM printer because, you know, they're 0.05 millimeter instead of like, you know, 0.1 or 0.2. Ooh, that sucked up the paint <laughs> quite well, better than I thought it would. I mean, I guess that'd be good if you're making models. I know a lot of people that use these printers and they'll, they'll print out like their, their uh, you know, board game characters and then they'll meticulously paint them. So, yes, it clearly accepts paint quite well, although maybe in my case a little too well. <laughs> pie, pie, pie. All right, I'm gonna replace the FEP film. Uh, unless I missed it in the box, the printer didn't seem to come with extra FEP film. See, there's my uh, scotch tape repair. This is all uh, quite mechanical. I'm gonna have to clean it up, but I will disassemble it first. It's kind of like a drum. Oh, the rhythm of my heart is beating like a drum. With the words I love, you're coming off my tongue. Oh, never did I roam. That doesn't, that doesn't fit. This frame looks to be made of steel. It is. Oh. Okay. I'll just clean this up separately. Oh, wow, look at all these screws. Fun. I'm interesting, pulling it out of the frame, it's already lost a lot of its tension. Oh, 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 I see. It's tensioned against this lip. Now that makes sense. Okay, let's see what's inside. Hmm. It seems like it, uh, yeah. When you put it together like this, it's got a little bit of a bow to it, probably about, I don't know, six millimeters, so maybe I need to space something underneath it when I put it back together. Is this film? Yeah, it's a little stretchy. Oh no, I touched the deadly resin with my hands. Ah! I just don't care. Unless it's like muriatic acid or something, I don't care. I mean, you know, your skin will grow back. It's a great, great, great feature of being human. Yeah, it's a human. What are you doing here in the realm of monsters? Ugh. Hello, does your movie need a David Bowie? Call 1-800-Jermaine Clemen, and I will be your David Bowie. Oh yeah, we need a David Bowie. No problem, but it's not a movie, it's a TV show. I don't care. I will be a I will be a David Bowie for any production. All right, you're you're a fart cloud. That sounds like David Bowie. Sign me up. So now, if you order a uh, Domino's pizza with contactless delivery, they put this little uh, cardboard thing on your porch. You know, because of snow. Because you know it's Canada, <laughs> according to some people. It says. Please recycle me, because clearly they're aware of how much waste all of this is creating in the world. Strangely, the environmentalists have nothing to say about that, so I'm going to reuse it for this. Okay, here's the FEP film. I'm sure that stands for something. Feel free to mention what it is in the comments below. Don't, don't be too snarky with your responses, because that could be seen as a 
Pico oppression. Pico, Pico, let's call the whole thing off. That one video I saw said to put a bottle cap on it. That seems like way too much. Well, it should be stretchy, right? We're gonna do this like lumber. Lumber construction? I think that's called carpentry. <laughs> lumber construction. Maybe it's like, oh, this chair has really good lumbar construction. Okay, so let's put the tray back here and then I guess the tensions? Oh, oh man, that's gonna be really tight. Maybe I don't have enough slack in it. Can you hear that? Boom, boom. Oh yeah. Oh man, this is like really tight. I feel like it's gonna explode in my face. My flag boy and your flag boy sitting by the fire. Oh, look, let me see the reflection of the light. Hey, it's actually useful for something for a change. It's uh, very firm and straight. Feels like it's probably a little over tensioned. Maybe I should have used a higher stack of post-it notes. But all in all, pretty easy to replace. I think the film's about, I don't know, five to ten dollars a sheet. So, you know, it takes you a little bit longer to swap it out, but it's a cheaper consumable than those form lab trays. Oh yeah! All right, I'll clean it up and stick it back in. Okay, after I replaced the film, I printed this friendly, flexible slug off Thingiverse. There is some cracking. The first layer, it stuck well, maybe a little too well. But I think some of the uh, filament fused back upon itself. So I'll see if I can separate these layers with my knife. Dun, 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 dun. I don't know if it shows up on camera. Actually, it looks like it does. See these little um, circlets here? That's actually the layer height. So when you come to the top of a curved object, um, you're going to see, you know, the layers. And it's pretty faint. Well, I mean, you can see it with the naked eye. But, you know, it's not nearly as severe as what you see in a uh, FDM printer because, of course, we're talking about a much tighter layer height. Do 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 do. Oh, I'm just a slug. Oh, you don't want to go that way. That'll take you straight to the middle of the labyrinth. Okay, I printed this small ring so I can look at it under this microscope. Um, one of the things I wanted to look at was the base of it because when I printed that slug, there was a lot of uh, compression on the first layer. And what I read was you can reduce the um, first layer exposure time because. The first layer is, well, overexposed, I guess, for lack of a better word. Uh, yeah, so on the microscope here, we can see this is supposed to be flat, but yeah, it's definitely got some compression. Maybe, maybe you're not really supposed to um, rely on having a flat surface on the bottom of it, like you're supposed to put everything on supports. Like, um, it's got like a fillet, but that's not part of the design. Um, oh, shoot, where's my metric dial caliper? Let's get the... Good metric calipers in. Ugh, that's about level. Let's see. Just about four millimeters. Okay. That's interesting. So the base is the right width. Where'd this chamfer come from? This on the side here? Yeah, that's kind of weird. Well, actually, the thing that's weird about it is that, well, yeah, because that's supposed to be level with the, well, no, that makes sense. Because if the circle is here, then the lines are supposed to come out this way and that way and then go up. So really, it seems like the main issue is that that line there isn't straight. So the first layer is actually dimensionally accurate. Actually, let me get it on the side here. It's just over four millimeters. That's correct for the thickness. Yeah, interesting. I guess I just need to learn more about these printers. Well, while I have while I have you, this is like a little pinky ring. It's like for a baby hobbit. 
which would be like, what, 30 years old? Let's get this into the microscope. Uh, yeah, the uh, PP Bus 1 Undervolt LCD chip driver. Oh, man, let me talk about real estate. Real estate is real estate. Okay, so this is on end, so this is how it would have printed up, of course, upside down. And you can see the little layers there, see that? So when you're on the side of the circle, the layers are closer together, but then as you get to the top of the circle's arc, there's more gap between the layers because the curve is flattening. So there you can see the very top layer right there, both sides of it. And these are 0.05 millimeter layers, so it's not even really visible to the human eye, but we can see it with the microscope here. Oh, look, you can see my awful cuticles in, uh-oh, uh I was eating Cheetos for lunch. Yeah, I'm not a hand model, so hashtag deal with it. Like on the side, like the layer height. So it's got the V cut on one side and then a rounded on the other. So the one on the left is a chamfer and the one on the right is a fillet. Um, a f oh, I'm sure someone's going to be like, no, a fillet is a fish and a fillet is a rounded... <laughs> Whatever, I don't care. Oh, yeah, there you can see the layer height in profile. That's the same thing that we saw from the top down. But yeah, I mean, the quality is really good. One thing I did run into when I was trying to print like those calculator buttons was um, when I was trying to clean, I, you know, put that paint into the crevasse. <laughs> That's what they would say in, in England. But then as I tried to wipe away the paint, it, some of it got stuck in the little, um, the styration. So... That was, that was a negative for me, but if you're trying to paint these, if you're like a model painter, you would like the fact that it has all these surfaces that basically take up the paint. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty good print quality. And this, this only took about 20 minutes to print. Okay, let's do a wrap up of this Anycubic Photon Mono SE resin printer review and wash system. Pros and cons. Okay, pros. Um, the price is great. It's very reasonably priced, especially compared to some of the resin printers of the past, like the Form Labs one, which I did test at one point on the show. The biggest thing I didn't like about that printer was the post-processing and curing and washing, but this system, I believe this is 99 bucks, makes it very easy. Speaking of which, um, the resin printer was easy to set up. You basically just unpack it and fill the resin tray. Of course, you gotta make sure that you read all the instructions first. So the Quick Start car didn't have everything that I needed, so I would say download all the instructions. There's two different instructions online, plus the Quick Start card. Read all of that before you get started. I didn't, and I paid the ultimate price. It creates high quality prints. Uh, we made the slug. We did have some first layer issues, but I believe that was more how I failed to set it up correctly for the first layer rather than the printer's fault. Because as we saw, once the printer gets cooking, the print quality is very high. And also it's fairly fast because again, instead of aiming a laser around, it's doing it all at once through a mono LCD, which means it can do each layer faster and the LCD itself will last longer. The resins, if you buy them online, they're actually uh, pretty affordable compared to other resins. I believe this one was about $29, which is actually not too bad. And they don't smell too bad. They smell like latex paint. Now, how comfortable you are getting the resins on your person, obviously that's gonna vary <laughs> for everyone. I don't worry about that kind of stuff too much, but I know other people do. And then uh, finally, it has really nice steel and aluminum construction. It's got cast aluminum parts, milled aluminum parts. Uh, steel linear rails. It's just uh, very nicely put together. I did see some people online saying that the viewing angle of the LCD wasn't that great, and that's true, it isn't, but this is you're not buying a phone, you're not buying a TV. The viewing angle of this LCD isn't really that important as long as you can read it. That's all that really matters. And for the cons, again, some of the instructions are kind of unclear. The um, assembly instructions that tell you how to start your first print do not tell you to remove the vat before you remove the LCD films. It does feel like there's some steps missing here. And as I mentioned earlier in the video and just now, you really need three sets of instructions. You need the quick start guide included with the printer, and then there's two different PDFs. I believe you can find them both on the uh, memory stick, but again, it's, it's a bit spread out because there's a different set of instructions for setting up the Wi-Fi and for setting up the physical printer itself, and of course that varies by printer. Speaking of which, the Wi-Fi feature, it does work, but it's fairly useless. Maybe it's one of those things where the chip or whatever they use to drive this had Wi-Fi on it and they just figured they would use it. Right now, at least, you can't send files 
to the printer over wireless with the Photon software, which is kind of dumb. You still have to use the mem a USB stick on the side. All you can really do is connect to it with your phone and monitor it, but as far as I know, that only works when you're on the same network. And yeah, having to print with the USB stick hanging out the side seems kind of ungainly. I know that's kind of a minor, you know, uh, complaint, but I mean, if you look at this nice cube-shaped system and then you've got this thing hanging off the side. So I wish it had some internal memory for storing prints or maybe like an SD card that would sit flush and it would be nice. I don't know, maybe they can improve it in the future. It would be nice if you could send files to it over Wi-Fi because then you don't have to run back and forth with a USB stick. So there you go, my review of the Anycubic Photon Mono SE Resin Printer. When uh, Anycubic first contacted me about this printer, they're like, hey, would you like to try out one of our resin printers now? And I told them straight up, you know, I've tried resin printers in the past and I wasn't really impressed with them because I didn't like the post-processing. It was like a lot of work. I couldn't just rip things off the build platform and use it. But with the wash station that they also sent me, it was actually not too bad. It was kind of like, you know, doing your clothes. You stick it in, you push a button, you come back. Yeah, so I'm gonna find a place to um, put this permanently and use it. I also need to learn more about how to design things for resin prints, but I have a couple friends that do resin prints, so I should be able to learn from them. And yeah, maybe we can use this for future projects down the road. Okay, well, there you go. Um, if you're interested in a resin printer, this one's pretty easy to get set up. It doesn't smell, it doesn't take up too much space, and the auto washer, I would say, is definitely worth $100. All right, well, we'll see you in the next video.